I'm glad to be back with everybody on YouTube. Kind of had a medical emergency happen about a month ago. I had my appendix rupture on me, so I've been out of action for about a month, and I'm glad to be back with you. On September 10th, 1967, NBC launched its newest American Western action drama series called The High Chaparral. The two-hour opening episode revealed the background to the series. Big John Cannon and his wife, Anna Lee, son Blue, and brother Buck arrived in the high desert scrubland of the southern Arizona Territory near the border with Mexico. There they purchased a rundown hacienda and began to establish a cattle ranch. The Apache, under the leadership of Cochise, are hostile and a constant problem to them. Anna Lee is killed in an early attack. And to survive, the cannons are forced to enter into a pact with a rich and powerful rancher, John Sebastian Montoya. He is the owner of a huge estate neighboring the High Chaparral on the Mexican side of the border. Essential to the alliance is the sealing of the pact by the marriage of John Cannon to Matoya's beautiful, dark-haired, strong-willed, but sophisticated daughter, Victoria. Big John is 30 years her senior. Matoya's carefree and sometimes reckless son, Manolito, whose relationship with his father is strained, accompanies his sister to the High Chaparral to get away from his father. The naming of the ranch was explained by the following dialogue between John and his wife, Anna Lee, in the opening episode. Anna Lee states that, isn't this beautiful, John? It should have a name. Big John says, will you go ahead and name it? Anna Lee asks, what is that bush, that green one? Big John says, that's a chaparral. Anna Lee responds, that's it then, chaparral. I christen thee the high chaparral, the greatest cattle ranch in the whole world. The series creator and executive producer was David Dortort. He is best remembered as both creator and executive producer of the long-running and beloved television western Bonanza. His interest in the Old West began as an early child. He would become a part-time magazine writer, then a successful novelist, and eventually he went on to Hollywood as a film writer. While he was writing the western series, The Restless Gun, the series' star and executive producer, John Payne, became so impressed with his work that he asked him to take over producing responsibilities. Following The Restless Gun, he then created and produced The Bonanza Pilot from a screenplay which he had written himself. The successful pilot was just the beginning of this Western series, which ran for 14 seasons and 431 episodes. By 1967, the High Chaparral had become David Dortort's new brainchild. In the spring of 67, he would hand over the day-to-day -day running of Bonanza to his fellow associates at NBC so he could put all his energy and attention on Chaparral. After the show's cancellation in 71, after only four years, he chose not to return to Bonanza and instead basically retire. Leif Erikson got into serious acting by accident. Paramount Films sent him a telegram wanting to screen test him. Only they were looking for someone else named Erikson. By the time they discovered their mistake, he had already been signed. He was in more than 100 films, having signed his first contract with Paramount in 1935. His career was virtually non-stop, but it was only after he acquired that rugged face look that he captured the attention of American audiences. David Dortort had first noticed him in a Bonanza episode in 1961. Remembering that role, he signed him up as the ranch patriarch John Cannon. With hundreds of film roles under his belt, Cameron Mitchell landed a leading role on The High Chaparral when he ended up sitting next to creator-producer Dortort and his wife Rose on a flight to Tucson. He had heard the couple 
was casting the show. So he bought a ticket to Tucson. He made sure it was an open seating ticket so he could sit next to them and pitch himself all the way from Los Angeles to Arizona. This salesmanship worked. He got the part, and Dortort later stated that he was forever in debt to him for his wonderful performance as Uncle Buck. Henry Darrow almost missed his heyday on the high chaparral because he chose an inopportune time to change his image and his name. David Dortort had seen him years earlier as a light-hearted Mexican peasant in the wonderful ice cream suit, and he had intentionally written the part of Manolito with Henry in mind. When it came time to offer the actor the part, Henry was nowhere to be found. Dortort had been searching for him under his former name, Enrique Delgado. But Henry, tired of being typecast as a Mexican, had changed his name to Henry Doro. The part nearly went to an Italian-American actor, but eventually Henry was located just two weeks before filming started. The part of Manolito was originally intended to be a questionable, slimy villain, but Darrow's charm came through so profoundly that the character was changed from naughty to nice. Mark Slade knew he wanted to be an actor after he filled in for a sick classmate playing the role of an English professor in the play The Male Animal. He got the part of Blue Cannon, son of the ranch patriarch John Cannon, through his electric performance in David Dortort's office. And this was even after the role had been originally assigned to another actor. Dortort was looking for a young man with just the right attitude to clash with authority. Mark provided what he was looking for by yanking the producer up out of his chair by his lapel in the impromptu audition. More than satisfied, Mark was then hired. Now let's talk for a moment about the beautiful Linda Crystal. After a brief marriage ended in an annulment after just five days, Linda briefly toyed with the idea of entering a convent and becoming a nun. She had several aunts that had followed this course. Fortunately for all of us, fate intervened. While she was vacationing in Mexico with her older brother, she was discovered by the film producer and director, Miguel Velasco, who also happened to be the son of the country's ruling president. She soon adopted her stage name, Linda Crystal, and made several Spanish-language films, which soon established her as one of Mexico's rising stars. Conscious of her potential and hoping to break into Hollywood, she decided to learn English as her fourth language. She was already fluent in Spanish, French, and Italian. She went into semi-retirement to raise her two sons when John Wayne coaxed her out for a part in his movie The Alamo in 1960. After a modest Hollywood film career, followed by guest roles on television, she learned of the casting for the part of Victoria Montoya and was invited to audition for it. In her telling, it was a memorable occasion. The scene they handed her to read was all tenderness and sweetness, and she knew that they were looking for a woman that had fire and spunk. So she asked him if she could throw away the script and just improvise her role. She went full throttle into it. She said she made up stories involving love, hate, passion, envy, jealousy. She also played a mother who had lost a son in the war. Before the audition was over, she had taken off her hat, her shoes, and even her jacket. In her extreme intensity, she was all over the people in the room, completely roughing them up. But the thing about it, she walked out with the contract. Having secured this role, she made it her own for four seasons and she would ultimately win two Primetime Emmy nominations and earn the Golden Globe Award in 1970 for Best Actress in a TV Drama. Led by Dortort himself, 
the High Chaparral's writers and producers were committed to a high degree of historical accuracy and realism. This began with the filming in the Arizona desert itself, rather than on a Hollywood soundstage like many of the westerns did in that day. The primary set for the main ranch was Old Tucson. Compared to other westerns of the time, the sets of High Chaparral were rich with detail and authenticity. This was true not only of the regular sets, but also of the saloons, cantinas, villages, and neighboring farms and ranches that appeared throughout the series. The primary sets were not static either, but changed with time as the ranch developed. The stunning backdrop throughout the series was nature itself, right? As a result, sometimes the crew and cast were filming in triple-digit heat. So it was really like the Old West out there. Sweat, dirt, dry mouth, and all. Over the years, many fans wondered and even sympathized with the actors about shooting in those conditions, especially Cameron Mitchell, who was always outfitted in all black. Wisely, though, on set, Cameron would take every opportunity that he could to climb into the nearest water trough. He could get away with this because his black outfit would not look obviously wet. So those in the tan leather or other shades of clothing who had to stay dry were constantly suffering from the heat, while Cameron was the only one that was able to stay cooled off. With the high chaparral, David Dortort had created yet another successful television western. While preparing for the show's fifth season, it became cost-restrictive for NBC to keep both Bonanza and the high chaparral on the air at the same time. Since Bonanza had been on longer and had a larger fan base, executives made the decision to cut high chaparral from the schedule. The final episode was aired on March 12th, 1971. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.